morning, everybody. Um, welcome. My name's Andy McGuire, and uh, I'm, I'm a local poet from just up, up the road in Grand Bend. And, um, and thank you for being with us today on behalf of Words Fest and myself. Um, I was thrilled when the, when the Words Fest organizers asked if I'd be interested in hosting this event today, a conversation with the Canadian poet Jeremy Dodds. And just, just uh, to let you know, um, we're going to start this morning with, uh, with a brief reading um, by Jeremy, followed by a conversation between myself and Jeremy. And, uh, and then we're going to open the floor up to questions for a few minutes at the end, um, just so you're aware. Jeremy Dodds grew up in Orono, Ontario, which is a gift of a name uh, for the hometown of a poet, uh, I think. Uh, he received a BA from Trent University in English Literature and Anthropology and an MA from the University of Iceland in Medieval Icelandic Studies. His poems have been translated into Latvian, Hungarian, Finnish, French, Swedish, Icelandic, and German. He's the winner of the 2006 Bronwyn Wallace Memorial Award and the 2007 CBC Literary Award for Poetry. And his first collection of poems Crabwise to the Hounds, which was published by Coach House Books in 2008, was shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize, the Gerald Lampert Award, and won the Trillium Award for Poetry. Uh, he's a poetry editor at Coach House Books currently, and he's joining us today. Uh, he's come from uh, Fredericton, where he's currently a writer in residence at the University of New Brunswick. Um, I was recently listening to an episode of Ideas on CBC Radio that was all about the organ, the instrument, the organ. And, um, and there was a renowned organist that was describing the physicality of, of playing the instrument. Um, the organist is, is bouncing up and down when they're playing. They're moving around a lot. Uh, they're, they're shifting between keyboards, um, playing with their hands and their feet and playing pedals and constantly pushing and pulling stops out. And as I was listening to it, I, I thought that um, it was a, a great image for describing and, and considering Jeremy's work. Um, his poems are at times wildly dispersive, intelligent, ravishingly textured, often very funny and strange too. Um, always bringing dolphins to knife fights and Julianing vegetables with bowling pins, I think. Um, and Jeremy juggles these axes with the octopoid independence of limbs and mind of a master organist, often pulling out, as it were, all the stops. And we're delighted to have him with us today. Please welcome Jeremy Dodds. Uh, this is a, a love poem of sorts, and it started off as a old country song, like an old school country song, sort of Hank Williams-ish. Then unfortunately maybe it got a little bit into new country, and um, now maybe it's somewhere in the realm of um, new age country. <laughs> so it's called Three on the Tree, and a fifth under the seat. I give up all I got trying to give you what you want when all you really need is your own self. Too gone for too long, or I've never actually been here, or can't be who you think I am, so become the one you never wanted. The kind of goodbye where no one leaves but those who are left Feel it real bad. Making love to you was like sheriffing a town that's already burnt down. On the bench of my F-150, I slept with an empty 26er of whiskey, and the only woman near was a ukulele. My dead granddaddy, with a yet-to-be-lit cigarette, strums his crabapple twig thumb, ain't she just the bee's knees on the window screens, please? What lurches must heal to a rabid wonderful? You could take me 
or leave me, so you took me and left me. Keepsakes are our only real estate. Can you not not be you for me? You know the wonderful go unavenged. I give the gift that keeps on giving myself up. I'm the poultry peeled of its downy bark, hung to cure in a woodshed's dark. I'd never ask for what ought to be offered. You've got me where you want me, but I ain't all there. I wish you wished you were here hunkered head in hand in the eye of a loop-de-loop -loop of coyotes who choir, do unto done as have has unto will, for left is as good as going as far as gone. Long Winter Farm. You've got to get to the country. The fields are empty, as if all farmhands have the clap. The trees have taken off their fatigues, yet no one's wives rise to shoo their houseplants out for exercise. Acne-scarred planets are light years, souffle years away, but toddlers with twig pistols guard the cisterns. I've met the albino alves who harvest the guano smoke bats leave in my lungs. I suction cupped a baby on board sign in the rear window of a hearse. Clouds suck sunsheen off the rocks. I've a mound of creased choir gowns that need irony. My favorite dog's buried in the yard. She was dead, but she got better. Now I have a Mennonite's fear of the automobile. A raven puts on his soot and goes to work the warmth from my algebra. Most guys in these parts grow a goatee, even though it's cattle country. Come on to the country. There's still seats in the nosebleeds. It's like living below a dam built during budget cuts, loving a geography this much. Why must this landscape look like luggage left unattended in an airport to get our attention? Any resemblance is purely reciprocal. I have an ex who's on the run in Mexico, or who has the runs in Mexico, or who is running Mexico, I don't know. Is her hair art or a gas lamp mishap, perchance? My dog and I were like two peas in an escape pod. When cattle rose from those valleys, cankles, and frost shackles, I watched silent films with my eyes shut. My biggest mistake was wearing white jeans to rib fest. But it's for fun us wax wings set controls for the heart of the sun. Get thee to the country. I've fletched every sparrow in this war. Our ash-eyed cremators have decided all's lost and paused their little holocausts. The mollusks shushed. When the kill switch sun kicks on, you can watch lunar rogues beeline into miles of turnstile trees, trees belching out birds like a sales force at the brink of banking hours, sucked in at dusk the way a rainbow sucks back into an only child. Each tree the scale model of a sky-proof roof giving up its life goals, each tree a little town like Jonestown. I've used a mirror to repel myself down the mountain to these trees, break one's wrist and you're an arborist. Each night the police chief sings my alibis as lullabies to his sweet niece. Come, come tend to me. I tend to disagree with victory. If there was a book about Long Winter Farm, it would begin, a river is always too curious of its end. I had been reading this, um, a book about a uh, gentleman who had a love affair with a dolphin. Um, apparently it was consensual um, from his point of view. And, um, and uh, so I, I, you know, of course, wanted to uh, see what it'd be like to be in his shoes. Um, this is called Rebecca. My dolphin eats glitter for breakfast. 
The jeweler's hammer of her sonar chirps chunks off the cubic zirconia of my hard-on for her. My dolphin wolfs glitter off A-list stars at after, after parties that bump till second sunrise. My dolphin and I used to do MDMA together and pass out our business cards to the weather. At the Science Center, kids ask how close we've come hunting down Atlantis together. My dolphin clicks into the telematron. If anything, we've come apart. My dolphin eats glitter to keep her figure, but once ate the forearm off a toddler who bent in to kiss her. Thank you for listening. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to read just a couple more here. Um, this is a poem that I wrote for a good friend of mine who passed away earlier this year, Tara Pachirsky. And um, it was one of those rare occasions where I'd finished the poem and went out to visit her before her passing and was able to read it to her and we got to talk about it. And um, It's called The Physical Impossibility of Living in the Mind of Someone Dead. Like a pheasant in the unpleasant suck of a tornado lets go of its vowels and sinks its ditty with glass mallets into the supercell of cancer that balloons on your pancreas for which you now take chemo. As though after the parade had passed, I scoffed your half of the wishbone, pried from a pheasant's down breast, a pheasant downed by the star spread of duck shot laid like a bald gown in a hope chest, its javexed hem of sea foam flung from the bottom rung of a dress rabid in pirouettes, a pheasant caught rearing a decoy as if the real McCoy, it froths on the rump of that sham, then flocks off aloft to a ceiling fan to cram its beak in breast, bereft with its own incest, a gown you shucked moments before you drowned as it was weighing you down, like owning the only telephone and dying so far, far from home, that gown bald like a pheasant cleft from what's left of the sea foam's jest, a pheasant crowned with a flock of deadlights as mopeds bring go-go dancers to the unrest, a gown whiter than a chef's jacket at the start of her shift from meringue to this mess, a house on a hill where no one will live due to its love of asbestos, a gown on a ghost ship that ran aground near the wedding while yours was at the seamstress getting sequins sewn in its inseam which seagulls brought in exchange for whipped cream and a gnaw on your pancreas, and in my own Baptist way I made this group of nuns wade into a dead shark's tank and menstruate all at once. But it wouldn't take and be undead. Too dead, the janitor said, pointing his mop head at the exit. You might recognize the title of this. Um, Canada. Canada, you must so shut the gaff pole holes in the seal pups' heads before the rich can be clothed. Canada, I know you're not as bad as Germany once was. I'll never fly Air India with a carton of geese eggs again. Canada, don't you know the beaver is a pussy? Canada, I refuse to take medication for this depression when we could just talk about it. Canada, I'm the bastard born of a fille du roi and a coureur de bois. Canada, je me souviens aussi, but when will we let Quebec out of its oubliette? I can't be the way you want me to be every time Clifford Olson dangles some summer schooler over Niagara Falls, or scientists have cloned Robert Picton to man our missing persons helplines, or Bernardo and Homolka have Tupperwared the all-you-can-eat buffet, or Russell Williams becomes the colonel of truth, his flak jacket packed with panties and IUDs. I can't sail out of a bell booth with a six-pack and pecs. Canada, I can't follow your national food guide to save my life. Canada, where the only difference between hockey and heroin 
is that with hockey, you shoot before you score. Canada, when will you take the kryptonite off Pierre Trudeau's chest? Canada, this is me being careless in my summer swimwear. Canada, what will happen to my Muslim mother's back if her airliner won't step back on the tarmac? Canada, how can I explain this to the geese? Canada, this is me in a burkini grinding down wreck beach. Canada, your house of commons is like watching cats doing it doggy style. Canada, no one should hero worship Wolf and Montcalm, but aren't First Nations really just second runners up and we the winners? This is what your right wing believes. Canada, the crow's feet off your eyes are trap lines for our tears. Canada, I know you sell their skins to America. America is tearless. Canada, can't you see she's a lot like us and we like her too much sometimes? Canada, I'd like to tar sand and feather you for not freeing Robert Latimer sooner. When will you raise Tommy Douglas from the dead? You're so sorry all the time. You with all the geological time in the world and me already rotting. Buffy, St. Marie replaced my wounded knee with raven sinew and virgins do. But Canada, I'll never outrun you. Canada, this is Terry Fox putting his wah-wah pedal to the metal. Canada, there is a choir of residential school children back up singing everything I say. The Dion quintuplets are kicking a can-can, but it only makes me want to party more. A mess of counterfeit Canadian tire cash on my closet floor. Neil chaws his caracas as our anthem pleads. Celine puckers at her kazoo while Joni finger licks her banjiles, high, high tensile pots and pans. Brian sits at his drum kit and gets on with it, but who knew that Pamela would be such a shoo-in, pounding her beautiful face on the organ. Canada, this musical intermission does not mean my hatred is in remission. What happens in Canada strays from Canada, our over-the-counter culture. Canada, the Tamil Tigers aren't a softball team. Canada, inside each Canadian is another Canadian, inside whom is a Canadian, in which is an alien. Canada, when will your Indian princess greet me at the lake shore in, in her corn husk crop top and ask me down her rabbit's hole? Canada, you're the land God gave to Cain. Canada, I feel like another weather. Canada, all my mistakes I make for you. Canada, hold still. What me, what war? Keep playing dead, Afghanada. Afghanada, when I was deployed to my high school prom, I brought my Woodstock Kalashnikov along. I am the bullet that carries the gun on its back. My bloodstream rolls along like a psalm. Canada, slaughter is the best medicine. What happens in Canada strays from Canada. You know we wash our cars with drinking water. Canada, did you kill Frank Cole? Delaire's not coming back from Rwanda. It's sinister. Serve and get served, Canada. After what you've done, no wonder Newfoundland is overfishing for compliments. Canada, are you that quiet neighbor with a queue of corpses in the deep freeze? Do you plan to tap that, or is it sovereignty, or a conservative white identity, or your hyper-mediocrity that insists on keeping the Arctic R's? Canada, I'm the bullet that carries the gun on its back. Canada, you're not as bad as America is. No one is. Not even North Korea. Canada, this hyperbole is like ordering a hurricane to hoist a fainted bird to its nest again. Canada, I feel like another weather. Canada, all my mistakes I make for you. I keep my fingers as crossed as Laura Secord's legs, that despite being human, Canada, I will be Optimus Prime of this country. Canada, this is a teleprompted love song, a ghost-written Dear John, and despite the bongos and bagpipes, this is a serene scene, Canada. Like you, I'm too old to die young. The tabula rasa of your Precambrian shields overwritten with capitalism. There, there, Canada. I'm pulling off the chloroform gag that is your flag and begging you to park your swamp reeds for me, the standard bearer of this jubilee. Your boreal banners waving to my leave. Canada, oft times, the obvious is oblivious to us. Canada, oft times, no matter how gorgeous they are, the stars sodomize our eyes. Thank you.
I love hearing you read. I've, I've, heard, I've heard you read Canada a handful of times now, and I always want to like check my pulse at the end of it because I feel like my heart is racing by the end of it. And, and you know, when, when I hear you read, and, and reading your work, I just, I feel enlivened. And it seems like, it seems like you really care deeply about the animate or about animating your work. And I wonder, has, has this element of, of performance, and you know, when, when you read, it seems like such a natural extension of your work as it exists on the page. And I just wonder if this, if this element of performance, if this uh, performance imperative has always been there in your poetic practice. I think um, it maybe started from, when I'm working on, on a poem, I'll tend to uh, record it every step of the way. So even when it's in an early, early draft, I record it, listen to it, um, which is really embarrassing if anyone found my computer, there's all this anyway, voice stuff. And at first it was really creepy to hear myself <laughs> all the time. Um, once I got over that, it was such a great editing tool for me to kind of hear it and, and then concentrate on the sonics of the poem instead of just the meaning and you know trying to get all that stuff in at once. Um, so then I found myself reading it with a bit more vigor <laughs> when I was recording them. And I think it maybe came out of that. And the idea too that I, I really like when I'm at a reading, um, when the poet's kind of teaching me how to read his or her work, um, when they get up and they kind of say, this is how I would like you to hear my voice when, when you're reading and that sort of thing. So, so it was definitely a conscious effort later on to make sure that uh, what I was working on and what I was trying to talk about was getting across in a, in a smooth sort of manner, but also so that people could hear the, the rhythms, et cetera, so, yeah. Is there, is there an audio book of, of Crabwise? Does Coach House do that kind of thing? No, no. there isn't one at the moment. Who, who, would, you, who would you want to, to be the voice for your audio book, do you think, of Crabwise? Uh, what, what celebrity? Jeremy Irons, maybe. Jeremy Irons, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, this past week, I, I, had the, I had the privilege of, of listening to the poet Lisa Robertson mm. give a talk, and, and her book, uh, as you know, just came out with Coach House called Cinema of the Present. Mm. And I was thinking after hearing her talk about uh, the form of cinema um, and the production value, I guess, of, of, of cinema and everything that goes into making a movie, the, the writing, um, the, the casting, the, the, the filming, post-production, there's, there's a musical soundtrack. Um, movies uh, tend to be big productions. And, and I thought that you know, your, your poetry has, your poems have high production value. There's, there's a kind of big budgetness about them, maybe. Um, and you know, I just feel like when I, when I sit down and, and read um, a Jeremy Dodd's poem, I feel like uh, more often than not, like I'm sitting down at a, at, at a kind of extravagant dinner party and wondering what, what the seventh fork is for, you know? Um, uh, I, I imagine you as this kind of all-in-one casting agency and director and um, soundtrack composer, post-production team, um, or to use the metaphor from, from my introduction, the organist managing all of these axes of your poetry. And I wonder if you could give us some sense um, or some insight into your process or, or, or how a Jeremy Dodd's production might come to be. Okay, that's a scary, that's a scary <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's varied. I was saying last night on the brief panel that whenever I find myself getting into some sort of routine, I try to jeopardize it, I try to change it um, as quickly as, po as, quick, as quickly as possible. This happened to me last night. Something, okay, there. It might be the metal plate or something. Anyway, um, yeah, I kind of get this sense whenever I get too comfortable that I have to shuck that that um, comfortable state and try something else out. Um, I tend to just try different things each, with each poem. So sometimes some of the poems, like the Canada poem started, just to use it as an example, 
started with a few lines, that hockey line, and I was trying to come up with a poem that I could use that hockey line in. And, uh, and then I was like, well, nobody's really written a ripoff of Ginsburg's America that I've seen, so maybe that would be kind of fun. So then I tried to match all the syllable counts in the Ginsburg poem uh, with my, with, you know, with talking about Canada. That kind of failed, it was too hard. <laughs> so I got out of that and just started plugging in a bunch of metaphors and stuff. And, um, and so it's really, I really kind of, at this stage in my writing, I'm a little more aware, I would say, of letting the poem do what it wants to do. Um, if it's not working out, I know enough to put it down for months, years at a time, come back to it, you know, get back into it, throw it out, cannibalize it, and maybe sort of keep, maybe kill my darlings, as they say, but keep their red shoes for later use or something. I know that's creepy, but, um, and, um, and so over, the, over time, it's become this, this process where uh, I just am comfortable with leaving things for a long time. And I mean, the poems that came in, this isn't, this isn't that strange for a first book, but so a lot of those poems were like seven years old or something by the time they got into the book. And, um, and that seems fairly natural. And now coming into a, a second collection, I feel like I don't have that seven years any longer. But I find myself looking at those poems and saying, okay, I'm just gonna have to let them go. So, so now it's a new stage where I'm just gonna try something different with them. So it's, it's always shifting. I mean, I pass stuff around to friends, um, maybe too much. They don't, yeah, they don't always seem to be that, that happy about getting them. Oh, here's another poem to look at. Anyway, so there's a group that I work with that really speeds things along. And so we've always looked at each other's work for probably about uh, 10, 12 years or more now. So, so the process goes through them. Um, I wouldn't say it's collaborative, but we definitely get our hands dirty in each other's work and um, it speeds things along. So uh, yeah, I think that's mostly where it comes from. And, and talking back to Lisa Robertson, actually talking to her quite a bit, she does some of the similar stuff that I tend to do. So I'll be reading something and then taking notes the whole time. Like, so the, I mean, she, she has this process where she'll be reading some philosophy or some theory and she'll be writing lines as she's reading. Not, not necessarily um, riffs on what she's reading, but just wherever it takes her. And so mm -hmm. that's part of my practice recently as well, is, is just uh, doing lots of notes while I'm reading and then trying to transform that into, into a poem. Hmm. You mentioned your, uh, your second book, which is, uh, and I want to talk about it, which is, which is a translation of the Poetic Edda, which is, um, which is the uh, 13th century, or at least written down in the 13th century, um, translation of the heroic and legendary tales, um, uh, poems of, of Iceland. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, the, the Edda, the poetic Edda, for people who maybe aren't familiar with it necessarily, and, and just talk a bit about how you came to decide yeah. to translate it. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a large sort of romance, paperback size manuscript on vellum that's located in Iceland right now. It was written down in around 1270, they don't know for sure, uh, by one scribe, probably a male. Um, it contains some of the, there's the prose edda and the poetic edda, and those two texts together make up basically everything we know about Norse mythology. Um, there are some, some rune stones, et cetera, that add to that, that are in Sweden. Um, and so the text itself, um, the actual manuscript is, there's no ornamentation on it. It's written in long line prose in order to save space and use up all the vellum. It's, uh, so when you're translating from the original manuscript, you have to kind of make the breaks, the line breaks using, um, using the meter. And so when I first started doing this, I'd start translating from the original manuscript. I had a bunch of facsimiles of it. And it's really difficult because they're, everything's abbreviated. So for instance, if Thor, the name Thor comes up, 
it's often just the thorn symbol and, and you don't really know if it's mm -hmm. Thor for sure and you kind of have to know a bit of the background of it. So I quickly moved from that because it was taking me years to just do one poem. And there's a standardized uh, version of it and start, I started translating from that. Uh, I went to the text mostly because I wanted to learn Icelandic. I was living in Iceland at the time. And I thought, what a better way than to learn, you know, learn some old Icelandic. And it's a case-based language like Latin. Um, so I started teaching myself old Icelandic by translating these poems. Um, and I quickly realized that, you know, the, in, in the case of Old Icelandic, you can put words in any order you want in a sentence. It doesn't matter, you can have your verb at the end. Or, um, and basically it's the endings that tell you what the subject, et cetera. Um, and it just seemed so magical to me. I mean, I'd done a bit of Latin, but it just seemed so, like such a, just a different way of thinking about the line. And I was sort of tired of what I had done in Crabwise. I didn't want to keep doing Crabwise-ish stuff. And I felt like this manuscript, translating this manuscript would essentially mess up my aesthetic, would switch my aesthetic, would force me to do something that I'd never done before. It was really uncomfortable. It wasn't, you know, when you do a translation in Canada like this, there's no funding, there's no, there's nothing, there's no awards that can go with it in Canada, which is really nice. And so it was kind of like a personal project that just was going to mess with my aesthetic was the basic mm. reason. Um, I thought I'd do it in a year or two. That was wrong. <laughs> uh, it took about five years. Um, and so it's th this text in general has really kind of formed, if you look through Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you can see he's stolen tons of names from this and he's stolen plot lines and mm. Um, the poetic out of there's about 33 pieces, 29 poems and, and a few um, prose pieces. And so you can just see how much influence it had on him. Mm. And then you see how it uh, influenced Game of Thrones and so all this stuff started flooding out of it as I was going through it. And obviously Wagner's The Ring Cycle comes from the Edda. Um, and a little known uh, British poet named W.H. Auden did a translation of it in the 50s. And so I felt like, and all the other translations were really ethnographic, done by academics for the most part, and some really gorgeous translations. And so I just felt like it was, you know, after I got the language under control, I just felt like, okay, I can do this. This is gonna be something I can do. And it might add to the, to the other translations. So I ended up doing my fail-safe recording uh, technique and uh, had some Icelanders reading it in modern Icelandic um, because we don't know how it was pronounced in Old Icelandic. And so then I was trying to match the cadences because they had started off as oral poems originally and they were passed sort of mouth to ear for centuries. And they're predominantly pagan poems at the beginning. The scribes that wrote them down in Iceland were, uh, were Christians. And so it's been filled, they've been filtered through this Christian lens. Uh, and so you can see small things come through through this Christian lens, like there's a, suddenly there's this one God to rule them all kind of thing that pops up at the end of one poem. And, um, and so the, the, the idea was, as I said, to get, to mess up with, mess up my aesthetic, but now I find my aesthetic is more narrative based because these poems are so narrative. Mm -hmm. So now I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of this narrative I have in all the new work. I, th there's a lot in there. Uh, that uh, in your answer that I want to talk about, um, I'm really I'm interested in in translation, this idea of translation, and and it seems like such a, a natural next step in in your um, bibliography that you've taken on this project because you've experimented in the past with with kinds of translation in in Crabwise um, you have a poem uh, that, uh, that is a, a transliteration I guess. You, you call it, um, of uh, a phone call um, that the CIA um, uh, tapped, that it was Ho Chi Minh mm -hmm. um, talking, and, and you translated this telephone call, um, not knowing Chinese at all, um, basically trying to match the, the phonetic sounds of, of what you were hearing in Chinese with, uh, with English correlatives, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
and Vietnamese. Vietnamese, sorry. Um, and I'm interested in this idea of translation. And you know, when when I read uh, a translated work of literature, um, a lot of the time I feel I'm aware of the fact that I'm reading a translation, like on a on a language level, right? Like I'm aware that my experience as a reader is being mediated. But then at the same time, um, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez often praised his translator's work as right. better than his own. And, uh, and his translator, actually his English translator, Gregory Rabassa, in his book on the, on the topic of translation called If This Be Treason, um, offers the elegantly simple insight, quote, every act of communication is an act of translation. Um, and to me, this touches on kind of the inherent challenge of mm -hmm. communication, right? And poetry is trying to, it's communicating something very different than, than say, technical writing and, and um, you know, translating an act, uh, 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 a work of poetry is very different than, than you know, translating the, the safety manual for a flare gun. Um, and I just wonder what you, what, what you're trying to communicate, what one tries to communicate in the translation of a work of poetry and what kind of accounting goes on, I guess. Um, there's this, I think when I, when I was going into the Edda, which is different than some of the transliterative pieces in Crabwise, I wanted it to be traditional translation, like Heaney's Beowulf, um, or Fagel's translation of the Odyssey and, and the Iliad. Um, but I found myself just, the first draft of the translation was really, I just was throwing stuff in there like crazy that wasn't in there and just having a blast with it. And, and then it went through another draft where that stuff got brought out of it. And then another draft. So I basically sort of translated the whole text maybe like three, four times by the end of, of and so I was struggling with translation theory the whole time and what I wanted to do, what I wanted to get across. And there's always been this um, Christopher Reed who translated uh, a bunch of Pablo Neruda's work has this quote where he says, it's really romantic, but he says, uh, reading a translation is like kissing a bride through her veil. Hmm. And so there's this feeling like you can't, I mean, translation is really, of poetry is almost impossible to some degree. And so you have to take it where you want it to go. You have to play around with it a little bit. You're never gonna get the same rhythms. Like I couldn't, it's an alliterative um, writing style that the old Ice, Icelanders were using and I couldn't match, match it every step of the way because there just weren't English words that could be put in where they needed to go. And so I would fool around and play with some, some assonance and then throw in some end rhymes um, to kind of make up for it. And so the, the process itself was always fraught with, oh, am I ruining this text or am I? And I think that's a good natural state to be in, not one where you're, where translators, and from other translators that I've spoken to, who kind of say, you want to always be scared. You want to always be double checking what you're doing. Um, so the Ho Chi Minh uh, poem that you were uh, talking about started off as, I was, I was on the internet um, on eBay. I had bought this truck and it only had a cassette player in it. And I was trying to look for people selling sort of a whole bunch of their cassette tapes. And there was a shoebox of so-called CIA wiretaps of Ho Chi Minh speaking. And I was like, yeah, right. So of course I ordered them right away. And then <laughs> they showed up and I was listening to them on the way to work and back from work. And it's just one side of the conversation. You don't hear whoever's, on, whoever's speaking with him. And of course I didn't know Vietnamese, but the cadences sounded so gorgeous. And then so unfortunately it wasn't very safe, but I started doing some notes while I was driving and, uh, um, and texting and eating a sandwich. And, <laughs> and then eventually uh, this poem just sort of erupted from it. And of course, like it would be gorgeous to find out if any of these lines match any of the Vietnamese by mistake even. <laughs> um, but I doubt he was talking about, you know, putting his laundry out and things like this. It's probably a little more important. Um, so going into the Edda with that sort of mentality about translation, it was nice to try on this traditional hat and say, okay, I'm going to try to do a line for line translation. 
make it like the Heaney Beowulf, but also make sure there's some modern idiom in there so that modern readers can get behind it. And, um, but yeah, this, the, I mean, that's a struggle. And yeah, I, I really feel like you can't, having done this large of a text now, I'm quite sure that translation of poetry is basically impossible and, <laughs> um, and foolish. But there's a text out of it, so yeah. One of, one of the things that, that your transliterated poems seem to Im imply, the Ho Chi Minh poem, for example, is that um, a certain amount of frustration is good, as, um, that not, not getting something, not understanding, um, can be productive or, or generative. And, um, and I mean, hearing you, hearing you talk about wanting to disrupt your aesthetic when you get a bit too comfortable um, is is really interesting. Um, I, I was at a um, an event yesterday with uh, Karlo Knausgaard, the Norwegian author of the six volume biographical yeah. novel called My Struggle, and um, and he he was talking about frustration yesterday, and uh, and he made this he made this really funny but totally true comment. He said. Um, that after, before he started this six volume epic work, um, he spent four years on another project um, trying to write about something else, about the death of his father, and he just kept failing and failing and failing for four years, and then finally he found a way to write about it, and he, he, he said though that the four years were necessary, he thought, to get to, that frustration was necessary, and he, and he said that he thought that not being able to write was a big part of being a writer. And I wonder about this, how, how um, this idea of not understanding, of frustration, of not getting something is, is valuable to poetry in general, or if it is, if you think it is. Yeah. I've never, I, I don't think I've really been extremely interested in meaning yeah. in poems, I've, my original poems that I've been working on over the years. I don't uh, regularly feel like I want to convey something to the reader. I like to leave things a little open-ended so they can come to some sort of decision on their own. Um, and it's a lofty idea to, in, to, in some regards, and, and that sort of fails because ultimately you end up speaking about something, no matter how much you tried not to, mm -hmm. even not speaking about something, speaking about something, that sort of idea. Um, the failure in general, I mean, I, could, I can pinpoint and every, every piece that I've done, where it's failed and where it's, where something else shone through and I, and I liked it more because of what peaked out due to the failure. Those transliterative pieces really ultimately, you know, I was trying to translate, I was talking about this a little bit last night, but the, um, trying, to tra trying to translate some of those Glenn Gould pieces into English, obviously from the beginning was a setup that was going to fail because it, you know, it's music and it's not language. And so there's, and so, but in that failure, these poems came out of it. And I feel like they have, they're more tonally aligned with the Gould pieces and that they, you know, they say something about how Gould played these pieces. So the translation in, in this case is more of a tonal one. And um, that failure taught me to try to fail harder. Um, and be more concise about how I fail. So when things are going, are starting to destroy themselves in a poem and something's not working and I can't come up with a line, it's, I know now just to throw in whatever I want and see what happens. Like, like I was saying at the beginning, just let the poem do what it wants to do instead mm -hmm. of trying to force this narrative into it or force this um, political agenda. I mean, Canada, that Canada poem is probably the closest I've ever gotten to writing anything remotely political and Again, it, it sort of felt like a failure of another poem, like I was saying, like I was trying to fit in these lines and then suddenly that poem started to fail and it became this political Canada poem, which I didn't expect. And I felt that, I feel like if I wasn't open to letting that happen, it would have been a different poem, maybe, um, maybe a better poem, uh, who knows. But ultimately these, those sort of failures are what I look for the most. And when I'm editing other people's work um, at Coach House, 
even some seasoned writers uh, who I've been working with, they, they'll come in and they have uh, all the same worries that us new writers have. Um, you know, they're, they want to convey something, they want to get something across. Oftentimes they'll have an agenda, like they really want to make sure this person realizes how hard their childhood was and this sort of thing. And oftentimes it's done in a linear fashion and so some, with those people sometimes it's really nice to come in and say, well how about we just do this, how about we just throw in an image here, move this around, like, and then just having somebody come in and say, this is failing, let's use the failure to, to grow something else, seems to work um, oftentimes. But then, yeah, yeah, the, the failure thing's interesting. Because part of it is you don't really know that you failed. <laughs> That's the worrisome part. Um, your readers know it right away. <laughs> and they're usually jerks about it. But, um, but yeah, yeah, the failure thing's interesting. Because one, oftentimes I'll think something failed, and then, you know, you, for the other writers in the crowd, like you send something out, let's say you send out five poems to a journal or something, and you're like, I threw in three of those poems, they're crappy, they're never going to pick those, and of course they pick one of those crappy yeah. poems. So you're like, what did I do wrong? So then, <laughs> what did I do right? And so it's, it's that constant kind of self-criticism that's going on. Um, so yeah, it's hard to tell what failed and what didn't at some points, I would say. It reminds me of that, that quotation by the American poet Dean Young, mm. let us get better at not knowing what we're doing, you know? Yeah, I subscribe to that for sure. <laughs> um, I want to ask one more quick question and then maybe open things up and see if there's a, a question or two in the audience. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, a little bit about travel. And You've, you've, done, um, you've done a substantial amount of traveling. Um, let me just find my, my page here. Um, you've done a lot of traveling um, residencies in, in, um, at, at the Burton House in Dawson City, um, in Banff, uh, Sweden, Greece, the list goes on. Um, Hawthorne Castle in Scotland, um, you did your MA in, in Iceland, and uh, you've been writer in residence in Calgary and currently out east. Um, and as, as a younger Canadian poet of, of an up and coming cohort, I, I, I should tell you that it all amounts to like a very mysterious aura about the Jeremy Dodds. Um, and and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna ask if you, if you put your le pants on leg by leg in the morning or, or just levitate and <laughs> lower yourself into your pants. Um, but uh, I wonder, uh, travel seems to be very important to Jeremy Dodds, the person, and I wonder if, if it serves some function uh, for Jeremy Dodds, the poet. Hmm. I, I, maybe it comes back to this idea with the poetic edit that I was talking about with messing up my aesthetic. So it's really nice to show up in a new place and have your thought patterns disrupted. I quite enjoy that. Um, so part of it is definitely that. The other part of it is that I feel like I can do the writing wherever I am. And so it, it feels nice to be able to take advantage of that, uh, being able to travel with work instead of you know, being, being in one place all the time. I don't really, I don't know how it filters in. Like, I don't really write travel poems ever. I don't know how that stuff filters into the work. Um, all I know for sure is that it changes something in me each time I show up in a new place and I sit down to work on something. I just see, I'll see something differently right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of a cliche answer, I know, but, but it's true. And so, so I'm constantly maybe chasing that dragon, so to speak, like, a, oh, things are getting too settled. I need to go somewhere and, and see what it does to me. Um, and for the most part, it's always been positive uh, with the work. I remember maybe um, when I was in Dawson City and I was working on these translations, I'd come from Iceland to Dawson for the three months and, you know, it's basically uh, a similar climate, similar light at that point. I was there in April and uh, so, you know, the darkness was, the 24 hours of, dar of darkness was seeping away and, um, it felt weird to come from Iceland where these poems had been written down 
back home to Canada and then to the Canadian Arctic mm -hmm. and to be working on them. I just felt, well, I just had this huge sense of pride for some reason. Mm -hmm. It was just really nice. I was like, oh yeah, this is my home. This is where I want to finish this book. And you know, it's a, it's a, it was written in a foreign language and it has all this mythology from Scandinavia, but I'm going to add this sort of Canadian aspect to it. So, so there is that sort of, um, long-standing showing up into a place being distraught to some degree you know having to find where the bank machine is and all that kind of stuff i just love it i just love how it affects my work and um, um yeah great well i think i think we have time um to open things up to uh for for a question or two maybe from from the audience uh I, we don't have a microphone so you'll have to maybe just project. Um, yeah. Uh, at the beginning, you had, uh, in your introduction, you had said that several of uh, Jeremy's poems have been translated into other languages. Uh, my question is, um, how successful have, do you feel those translations have been, since translation seems to be a, a big topic this morning? Uh, a lot of them I don't know the languages, so I can't really tell. Um, so the Latvian one, for instance, uh, I had a Latvian friend kind of look at them and he said, yeah, they're okay. <laughs> so um, the Icelandic ones uh, I hear turned out quite well and I can read them a little bit, obviously the modern Icelandic a little bit. So, but what the translator did, I think in, spirit, in keeping with, with the kind of work I do, there's a poem that's basically a, a list of cliches that are kind of turned around a little bit, mixed metaphor stuff. and. And so he didn't have, he couldn't translate it. It was, he did, it was impossible to translate, he said, because um, Ice, Icelanders just didn't have the same sort of cliches and it was, so he basically rewrote it with Icelandic cliches and presented it as a translation of this, which I was all for, I thought that was lovely. Um, a couple, like the French ones I can understand, but for the most part it seems like if they didn't kind of mess around with it like the Icelander did, then I wasn't too excited about it if it was kind of just a straightforward translation. Um, I understand that the German translator also played around with sound, so couldn't get some of the rhymes that I had, so found other rhymes. So that was nice to hear. That kind of thing warms the heart to hear that someone's playing around with your work like that and messing it up and yeah, that was nice. Yes. What is your relationship to rhyme, and uh, what is your perspective of the Canadian poetry scene's uh, relationship to rhyme? Has it changed over the years? I think, I think with the, uh, from what I can tell, I mean, I, I love rhyme maybe too much uh, sometimes. I'm not sure that I'm super interested in form, formal rhyme all the time, but uh, I see that it. I see that the, Brit like the Brits have influenced it quite a bit. At least in my generation, I see a lot of my cohorts have been reading tons of Brit poets. And so there's still a lot of the sort of mainstream Brit poets are still playing around with sonnets, et cetera, as are Canadians. So I see a lot of influence of that coming through, a lot of the Ted Hughes, a lot of um, Alice Oswald stuff coming, you know, that plays on, on those people. But not so much plays on the Wendy Cope, like uh, the British poet who really does hard, rhyme, hard end rhyme. Um, some of the cohort that maybe works around the formalists, um, around sort of Carmen Starnino and, and that group still seem, like it seems to be alive and well. Yeah, yeah, I, wanna, I would like to play around with it a bit more at some point. Um, I, as, per, as to where it is right now, I don't know. I don't see a lot of it, I mean, I mostly have been reading American work for the last few years, and it's definitely not that prominent in the States. So I would suspect that, you know, Canada seems to be influenced by both the Brits and the Americans, obviously, and, and so I, you see the, the camps in Canada sort of divided. There's this more formalist camp, and then there's this experimental kind of more lyric American camp, um, just to simplify it. Uh, and so, yeah, it seems to be alive and well. I don't know, there seems to be a lot of it being published in Canada and still the Brits are doing it, so yeah, yeah. Does that answer it a little bit? I basically don't know. 
and I'm trying <laughs> to make something up, but I, I can't, I, my, finger, my finger is on the pulse more of the lyric American stuff at the moment. And so I'm not reading a whole lot of formal, formal stuff in Canada, but, but I see it. I see it come across the coach house desk and some of it's super great, so yeah. Yeah, one last question maybe in the back there, yeah. I was just wondering, was poetry really important in your childhood or did you somehow come to early adulthood and say, I am a poet? Do you know? Yeah. Um, it wasn't, I, I wanted to be a, you know, a, like a rock star type. Um, I was, so I was trying to write songs and I was, I'm basically tone deaf. So it, it sort of worked into this thing where uh, somebody said to me, a high school teacher actually said, oh, this looks like a, this is a good poem. Might not be that great of a song lyric, but it seems to be, seems to be somewhat of a poem. So, and he sort of told me to send it out. And then things, I didn't really start taking it seriously till maybe mid to late 20s. Um, uh, I'd always been, been working on poems, but I didn't really think of myself as a poet. And really I only do now um, when I'm forced to, but it feels, uh, it feels like something I just kept coming back to. Um, whenever I was sitting down to do something else, it was like, oh, I can also work on a poem. I know, maybe I know how to do this a little bit better than I know how to play the ukulele. And so it just, it just kept, I just kept playing to what I thought of at the time as a strength and it just grew from there. But yeah, my, my family was, aren't big poetry fans and so I didn't grow up with a lot of poetry. Um, my grandfather definitely read poetry to me all the time. And so maybe it was something that grew from that. And just hearing, and I, I feel like when I was reading, actually it was funny because when I was reading those poems, I definitely fell into one of his cadences. I could totally hear him reading to me. It was really nice actually. And so, um, so yeah, maybe I'm sort of stealing from his, his cadence repertoire, but um, yeah, that's where, it, that's where it came from. Well, that, that's it. Oh, here we go. Well, I, I, I think you're a rock star, Jeremy. Um, you, you have books here, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, including the edit? Yeah. Okay, well, um, buy, buy a few books for yourself. Do some early Christmas shopping. Um, if there are any children in your lives who have been bad this year, the edda has some heft to it and could really weigh a stocking down with some false hope, probably. Um, <laughs> So I'd, anyways, I'd like to thank Jeremy, thank WordsFest, and thank all of you for being here. It's been wonderful, and enjoy the rest of the day and the WordsFest weekend. Thank you.